Good evening, guys. So tonight, what we're going to do is I'm going to read a quick passage from my H.P. Lovecraft book, and afterwards, I'm going to do a quick, well, I say it's quick, but it may not be quick, but anyways, I'm going to do a quick clearing session, so you get a story or prose poem, and a Reiki session on a video. Sound good? Cool. Okay. <clears throat> so the prose poem I'm going to be reading tonight is called Neolethrotep. Neolethrotep, the crawling chaos. I am the last I will tell the audience void. I do not recall distinctly when it began, but it was months ago. The general tension was horrible. To a season of political and social upheaval was added a strange and brooding apprehension of hideous physical danger, a danger widespread and all-embracing, all such a danger as may be imagined only in the most terrible phantasms of the night. I recall that the people went about with pale and worried faces and whispered warnings and prophecies which no one dared consciously repeat or acknowledge to, ex to himself that he had heard. A sense of monstrous guilt was upon the land, and out of the abyss between the stars swept chill currents that made men shiver in dark and lonely places. There was a demonic alteration in the sequences of the seasons. The autumn heat lingered fearsomely, and everyone felt that the world and perhaps the universe had passed from the control of the known gods or forces to that of gods or forces that were unknown. And it was then that Neolethrotep came out of Egypt. Who he was, none could tell. But he was of the old native blood, and looked like a pharaoh. The peasants knelt when they saw him, yet they could not say why. He said they had risen up, he said he had risen up from the blackness of twenty-seven centuries, and that he had heard messages from places not on this planet, and to the land of civilization came Neolethrotep. Swarthy, slender, and sinister, always buying strange instruments of glass and metal and combining them into instruments yet stranger. He spoke much of sciences, of electricity and psychology, and gave exhibitions of power which sent his spectators away speechless, yet which swelled his fame to exceeding magnitudes. Men advised one another to see Neolethrotep and shuddered. And where Neolethrotep went, rest vanished, for the small hours were rent with the screams of nightmares. Never before had the screams of nightmares been such a public problem. Now the wise men almost wished they could forbid sleep in the small hours, that the shrieks of the cities might less horribly disturb the pale, pitying moon, as it glimmered on green waters gliding under bridges and old steeples crumbling against a sickly sky. <clears throat> I remember when Neolethrotep came to my city, the great, the old, the terrible city of unnumbered crimes. My friend had told me of him, and of, its, and of his impaling fascination and allurement of his revelations. <clears throat> and I burned with eagerness to explore his uttermost mysteries. My friends said they were horrible and impressive beyond my most fervent imaginings, that what was thrown on a screen in a dark room prophesied things none but Neolethrotep dared prophesy, and that in the sputter of his sparks there was taken from men that which had never been taken before, which showed only in their eyes. And I heard it hinted, abroad that those who knew near Lethrotep looked on sights which others saw not. It was in the hot autumn 
that I went through the night with the restless crowds to see Neolethrotep. Through the stifling night and up the endless stairs into the choking room, the shadowed and shadowed on a screen, I saw hooded forms amidst ruin and yellow evil faces peering from behind fallen monuments. And I saw the world battling against blackness, against the waves of destruction from ultimate space, whirling, churning, struggling around the dimming, cooling sun. And then the sparks played amazingly around the heads of the spectators, and hair stood up on end while shadows, more grotesque than I can tell, came out and squatted on the heads. And when I, who was colder and more scientific than the rest, mumbled a trembling protest about imposture and static electricity, Neolethrotep drove us all out, down the dizzying stairs into the damp, hot, deserted midnight streets. I screamed aloud that I was not afraid that I could never be afraid, and the others screamed with me for solace. We swore to one another that the city was exactly the same, and still alive, and when the electric lights began to fade, we cursed the company over and over again, and laughed at the queer faces we made. I believe we felt something coming down from the greenish moon, for when we began to depend on it for its light, we drifted into a curious, involuntary formations and seemed to know our destinations, though we dared not think of them. Once we looked at the pavement and found that the blocks were loose and displaced by grass, with scarce a line of rusted, <clears throat> of rusted metal to show where the, tra- the tramways had run, and again we saw a tram car lone windowless, dilapidated, and almost on its side. <clears throat> when we gazed around the horizon, we could not find a third tower by the river, and noticed that the silhouette of the second tower was ragged at the top. Then we split up into narrow columns, each of which seemed drawn in a different direction. One disappeared in a narrow alley to the left, leaving only the echo of a shocking moan. Another filed down a weed-choked subway entrance, howling with a laughter that was mad. My own column was sucked towards an open country, and presently felt a chill which was not of the hot autumn. For as we stalked out on the dark moor, we beheld around us a hellish moon glitter of evil snow. Trackless, inexplicable snows swept asunder in one direction only, where lay a gulf all the blacker for its glittering walls. The column seemed very thin indeed, as it plodded dreamily into the gulf. I lingered behind, for the black rift in the green-litten snow was frightful, and I thought I had heard the reverberations of the dis quietening wails of my com- of my companions as they vanished. But my power to linger was slight. As if beckoned by those who had gone before, I half floated between the titanic snowdrifts, quivering, afraid, into the sightless vortex of the unimaginable. Screamingly sentient, dumb, dumbly delirious, only the gods that were can tell. A sickened, sensitive shadow writhing in hands that are not hands and world blindly past ghastly midnights of rotting creation, corpses of dead worlds with sores that were cities, charnel winds that brush the pallid stars and make them flicker low. Beyond the world, vague ghosts of monstrous things half seen columns of unsanctified temples that rest on nameless rocks beneath space to reach uh, to reach up to dizzy vacua above the spheres of light and darkness and through this revolting graveyard of the universe i muffled maddening beating of drums maddening beating of drums and a thin monotonous whine of blasphemous flutes 
from the inconceivable, unlightened chambers beyond time. The detestable pounding and piping whereunto Dan slowly, awkwardly, and absurdly the gigantic, tenebrous, ultimate gods, the blind, voiceless, mindless gargoyles whose soul is near Lethrotep.